I know I'm wrong. I know that it's my personal laziness that pushes me too far into that end of the <laughs> spectrum, and I know this organization is there. Can we use the, the basic features of dynamical systems to understand what this complex uh, nonlinear system is doing? The idea of universality is that different dynamical systems have properties that are conserved despite the fact that the equations are different, or in, in our parlance, despite the fact that the parameters of our neural networks are different. Universality is sort of a question that has to be asked, but again it lies on a spectrum. Breaking universality gradually and using that as a constraint to link to the data can be sort of a, a promising way forward. Asking the, the right question is the hardest part of science. I want to be in a place where people ask me that question. This is Brain Inspired. What's the best way to model the functioning brain using neural networks? How do we even talk about the emergent properties of massively recurrent interacting neurons without just throwing up our hands and falling back on the vocabulary of folk psychology? Neuroscientists and AI researchers for years have been interested in how exactly deep learning networks work, how to open the black box, so to speak, and make sense of those networks. After all, if we can't make sense of a deep learning network, uh, what chance in hell do we have of making sense of the infinitely more complex real thing, the brain? Omri Barak and David Sosillo are two peas in a black box pod. Hmm, that was dead on arrival. Uh, <laughs> uh, Omri and David wrote a paper about a decade ago actually called Opening the Black Box where they used the language and tools of dynamical systems theory to describe the emergent properties of artificial recurrent neural networks, or RNNs, and they found reliable structure within the dynamics, something David has come to call the dynamical skeleton of the RNNs. Omri works out of the Israel Institute of Technology, and David, who's been on the show way back on episode 5, I think, long time ago, works out of Stanford University as an adjunct professor, among other venues. And since that black box paper, they've both continued pursuing how much we can glean about the function of RNNs using those tools of dynamical systems theory uh, and how it compares with and, and how relevant it is for how brains function. So this episode is basically all about that. Uh, Omri and David reflect on their journey since that original black box paper. We discuss the merits of the machine learning approach to modeling brains uh, versus the, the sort of more classical computational modeling approach. We talk about the idea of recurrent nets uh, as model organisms, similar to how we treat non-human animals uh, as model organisms. And we get into their recent thinking about all of this. David's been studying the idea of universality, for instance, uh, which is the idea that there may be commonalities among artificial and natural RNNs, despite their vast differences, both among them and between them. And Omri, among other things, has been studying the learning process in RNNs, like how the dynamics uh, can act as a sort of ongoing prior on the learning process. So if some of that doesn't make sense, uh, don't worry, they describe it better in the episode. And I link, of course, to the related work in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 97. If you like the show, consider supporting it on Patreon, where I offer a few extra things. Um, there's a Patreon link at braininspired.co. Uh, to check that out. I am Paul. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. And here are Omri and David. So, David, um, you were on an, uh, a super, super early episode. You must have some foolishness in you to have appeared so early in the podcast, but uh, welcome back to you. Thanks for coming back. And Omri, we, um, I had emailed you, I think, shortly after, maybe I interviewed David, I, I'm not sure, around the same time, but uh, you were, I think, sipping martinis and roller skating somewhere on vacation, and then it just hasn't worked out back and forth. But I'm glad that uh, you're both yeah. here now with me. So thanks, guys, for joining me. Thank you. Good to be here. 
Um, maybe the place to start is that you both, uh, you, you co-wrote a 2013 paper um, called Opening the Black Box, and it was about using dynamical systems theory to help understand what might be going on in neural networks, uh, well, of networks of, of actual uh, interacting neurons, um, also artificial recurrent neural networks. So it's been almost a decade, let's say, we'll just push it a few years, call it a de- almost a decade, uh, since you co-wrote that paper. And you've both, you know, successfully been continuing to open that black box, rummage around in there and, you know, mess around and pull things out and push things around. So we're going to talk about a lot of that stuff today and, you know, where it was and how far it's come and, and where you are now. But I'd like to just start asking you kind of a simple question, I hope. What, um, and maybe Omri, we'll, we'll start with you since you're new to the podcast. What's one of the most, you know, the best scientific moments you've had in your career? Um, well, actually, I think the black box paper um, <laughs> might have that uh, moment. Um, what moment is that? Because that, but because publishing a paper is like such a long process. Is there a moment? Yeah, no, but but the, yeah, the particular thing um, again, working with David on this, uh, you know, trying to understand what's going on there and how come these things works, and um, in particular, actually, I remember one. One point where we sort of, uh, you know, sort of technical, but um, looking at, at one of these trained networks and finding um, a fixed point that turned out to be sort of a subtle point that had sort of one unstable direction and 999, sort of opposite, one unstable and 999 stable ones, uh, which is sort of what we thought we might find there, uh, but actually finding it, um, was kind of cool. I mean, it was it was really nice to see that this ID actually works. <laughs> um, and I think one one of the frustrating and nice things with this uh, approach is that there are almost no guarantees. So you have this idea that you know the network might operate in a certain way, and then you look at it. And then sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Mm. Um, and that leads to um, quite a lot of frustration <laughs> when it doesn't, but I, I guess correspondingly to quite a lot of fun when it does work. Yeah. So the so the backstory there, it, it, Omri, correct me if my memory has uh, gone astray, but you know, that paper is really just a textbook application of uh, stability theory to high dimensional nonlinear neural networks, right? Recurrent networks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so the way that it went down is I had just finished taking that class. And so I was mucking around with artificial RNNs, but you know, back then I'm just going to say RNNs now. Yep. And um, I said, well, geez, maybe this technique works. So, so there's basically there's a culture clash there because in, in the technique of stability analysis and nonlinear dynamical systems analysis in general, it's a very mathematician's approach. And so they like to study these two, three dimensional systems where you can actually prove something, right? So it was not really a numerical approach, whereas what we did in that paper is very much a numerical approach. So the way it went down is I walked up to Omri, I was like, hey, do you think that fixed points might be negotiating the dyna- dynamics? Nowadays, we would call that, do you, we, the way I would say it now is, do you think the fixed point structure is the dynamical skeleton of this, of this system, right? And he said, yeah, maybe. And so, <laughs> so, so then, but, so, but I didn't know what to do. Right. And so Omri had the idea, he figured out how to make the optimization go. And so then once we had like, Hey, wait a minute, there's a thing here. Then we sat down together and started analyzing a bunch of examples. How often do you think that happens when someone is just taking a class and that class sort of leads to an idea and, you know, you go from class versus having an idea through your own research. I mean, I know that they're all intertwined. You know, I think, I think anywhere ideas, anywhere you get ideas from, right? So the, the, the problem with, with classes is like, unless you're really in, in a new field, and in this case we were, it's very likely that someone will have already uh, trod over that territory. So yeah. more likely your own research program and the people you're talking to over time are going to give you ideas that are fruitful in terms of the cutting edge, but anything goes. So, so for the record, before we proceed, uh, are you guys, and Omri, I guess we can start with you as well, are you more interested in brains themselves or how, how brains function, you know, like, you know, the mind or intelligence or the relation between brains and minds or, or something else? How would you describe what it is that, you know, gets you out of bed? Yeah, um, that's a surprisingly tough question. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm I'm in a field where identity crisis is sort of the norm. You know, uh, uh, what, sort of the what am I? Uh, what are you? you know, yeah, math, mathematics, mathematician, phys- physicist, uh, biologist. Um, I think what I'm interested in is how complex systems adapt to their environment. In a sense, I, I, I think that sort of, and that includes artificial networks. It includes um, cancer and you know, genetic networks. It includes um, uh, brains, mm-hmm. but. But in a sense, uh, I'm interested in the uh, in the commonalities between these and and the differences, and whether studying one can inform us about the other. So I, I my intuition is that um, there are things that are similar among all of them, and there are things that are certainly different. But also, technique-wise or data-wise, there are aspects that are more accessible. In, in one or the other, and therefore sort of hopping about between them has the potential to sort of, you know, keep providing fresh viewpoints. And uh, um, so I think that's sort of part of what wakes me up. You're almost saying you're interested in complexity. Is that too far a stretch? Or complexity theory, for instance, right? Complexity science, because it seems yeah, to be I a... Yeah, but I think that's sort of not... I would say it's not well defined enough, or I mean, it's too large. Uh, yeah. Okay. If if you will, I mean, you could say you know how you know the properties of strange attractors, right? Is that complexity? Mm-hmm. Could be. I'm not interested in that. I mean, it's it's you know it's fun if I bump into it, but but it's not what drives me. Um, sort of the, the learning process, the, the interaction of a complex system with its environment. It's the adapting. And, and how yeah. that changes the complex system. And, and why, why, do we, why does the system have to be complex in order for that to work in the first place? David, what do you, how would you respond to that? Uh, so, well, for my part, I'm very much uh, interested in how the brain works, right? That's already being uh, a topic that's impossibly difficult. So I'm happy. I'm happy to uh, hang out in that world. Uh, very much motivated by how what we might understand about the brains can improve the lives of uh, people. Um, so for me, uh, you know, the crossover is into neural networks because I do believe that they are some if you will, model organism, artificial minor portion. We can study these things in ways that we cannot. So for someone who has a sort of technical bent, uh, you know, the experimental difficulty of neural science is just impossible. And so we, I've been focusing on these other tools because of sort of both a hypothesis, that is my guess, and uh, some, some very preliminary pre- uh, empirical evidence that artificial networks are actually pretty useful. So those, that's, that's the world in which I'm, I'm hanging out. So one of the ways that people think about brains is that brains compute things, that they're computers, maybe not digital computers, the you know, von Neumann-style computers, but there's a lot of computational descriptions about what brains do. Uh, and I'd like to ask about this idea of computation through dynamics and how how to think about that kind of computation versus the way we normally think of computation as using an abacus, right? And moving a few pieces around and getting an answer or something. David, um, maybe you can speak to what, how, how that, how computation through dynamics differs from a more traditional Turing machine like computation that we would uh, consider. Right. So the, the phrase, so coming, just starting very high level, you know, there's this, our brains, computers, you know, yes, brains are computers. There's, they're also a lot more though, right? I mean, this is a computer that cares about <laughs> its place in the world and, and surviving, et cetera, et cetera. But on top of all that, it is also a computer. Uh, so that's my opinion. Uh, the way that I like to say it is that brains are really crappy von Neumann computers <laughs> built on amazing neural networks. And, you know, modern day artificial neural networks are really crappy artificial neural networks built on top of amazing von Neumann machines. Nice. Right. So they're related somehow. Um, so that's sort of my perspective, uh, there. Now you, there was, there was a, another question that you were, you were asking. Well, just how to think about, um, computation through dynamics, like within the dynamical systems, uh, 
framework, right, as a trajectory through dynamical space versus a more static and uh, binary like Turing machine type computation, if, or if I'm even thinking about them differently in the correct way. So getting to the answer through dynamics versus getting to the answer through binary computation, let's say. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, yeah I, I guess so. So the way, the way I would say it is, I mean, dynamics are everywhere, right? I mean, even when you have a for loop and you want to do a sort, you are still doing something iteratively, right? So uh, there, there you go, right? Um, but, but, you know, these days, especially in the machine learning world, the conversation is often one about developing representations that are, that are useful for computation versus, uh, at least, you know, what we've been trying to put forward, the dynamics of a computation. And so I don't view these things necessarily as opposed, rather complementary. It's just that uh, I don't really know of anyone who's an expert at all of it. So I'll just admit my own lack of expertise in the sort of feed forward representational world. Although, of course, I, you know, I can have a conversation about it, but I don't, I don't research it. So in the computation through dynamics framework, the idea was like, Hey, can we use the, the basic features of dynamical systems, fixed points, linearizations, all of those tools to understand what this complex, uh, nonlinear system is doing? And what has turned out to, in, to be true, and this is why I think there's there's energy behind it, because it's actually it working to some degree, right? It's not perfect, but I mean, we're, we're dealing with really hard stuff here. But it's it, it, the, empirically, it's turned out that you can actually glean insights from some of these techniques. And so that's really what's driving it. It's not so much that this is the only thing. It's rather that, hey, this thing is actually yielding insight. Well, Maria, I don't know if you want to comment on uh, that. I guess- yeah, just just one one thing that um, I guess it's a sort of an association from that is about um, precision or um, how exact things are, and um, the, the the concept that at least I you know I associate with the Turing machine is is a very um, precise, uh, deterministic, if you will, um, trajectory. Uh, that has a very, you know, a discrete set of options. In a dynamical system, naively, you could think of this high dimensional space where you can wander about and maybe have some noise and, and things of the sort. And a, a trained recurrent neural network, after it has formed these fixed points, in, in a sense is in between. If all it has, let's say in a flip flop example, if all it has is, you know, a few very strong attractors and everything around it is a business of attraction of one of these attractors, then in a sense, it's almost like this Turing machine because um, there are very few options for that dynamical system to be at. But I think one of the nice things about these trained networks um, is that they're imperfect, uh, which I think is, is what biology does as well. They, they, they have to be good enough. They don't have to be perfect. And that means that you don't need a fixed point. You can have a slow point. You don't need a, a, you don't need all the trajectories to end up in the right place. You need most of them. So the, the, the connectivity that, that has been obtained via training, um, restricts the space of possibilities of this dynamical system. So you can't wander about in this high dimensional space and get lost. But it doesn't restrict it to just being two, three options like a, a well-designed and be, well-behaved program would. So it's sort of in between. Um, and I think this, this in between, this sort of, these approximate objects are, are part of, are a characteristic feature of, of both train networks and I think biology. That idea of sort of wandering around the, uh, area of what a Turing machine would find in a, a discrete answer to, you know, whatever output, right, you would, you're going to eventually output that dynamical systems idea of wandering around. And, and that approximate area has, I mean, it's, it's really changed the way that I think about, uh, well, minds and brains. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm wondering if your work, both of you, if, if your work on using applying dynamical systems theories, theory to recurrent neural networks, if, you know, how your, your thinking has evolved with respect to, um, 
recurrent neural networks themselves, just very high level, you know, have that you started in a Turing place and now you're in a much different place or how has it sort of changed the way that you think about these things? Go ahead, Omri or, or David, what, whomever. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm fired up for this one. Um, All right. So, <laughs> so, you know, if you just look a little bit at the history, uh, First, there were uh, hot field networks, right? And those are just attractor networks. You can really think about just mm -hmm. marbles rolling down hills, right? And um, so that, that that was a very powerful insight, and people really thought thought that through for a long time. Uh, but it's restricted because those dynamics are very limited. Um, and so then, you know, this idea came out of, of of echo state network or liquid state network, and that's the idea that hey, you just you throw a pebble in a pond, and whatever ripples and crazy interactions it has with the edge of the pond and other ripples happening in the pond, you can decode that and make sense of what happened. In other words, you can back out the pebble getting thrown into the pond. So, so that's the idea of liquid state or echo state networks. And that's sort of the radical other side, right? This is as far unstructured as you, it doesn't even matter. Like any medium that sort of reverberates can be used for computation. So, um, what, what has happened for me, especially with the, the onset of deep learning, uh, is that I, I started applying echo state ideas to neural data. And what I discovered very quickly was that real biological neural data is much more structured than echo state mm -hmm. networks are. And that the, 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 the sort of wiggles in an echo state network are just sort of wild and out of control in ways that don't make sense empirically when looking at brains. So, um, well, we started trying backprop now. And that is to say no longer just a random network that where you have a readout that you're training, but the whole thing gets to be trained. And all of a sudden, the comparisons started getting a lot more um, uh, close between the brain and the artificial networks. And I think it just speaks to the idea of, of what Omri said, which is that, you know, things have to be good enough, right? The, the, the computational primitives have to be good enough, but otherwise it's sloppy and that's okay. And that's kind of the world that these artificial networks live in. And apparently, if you believe the comparisons between brains and artificial networks, it's likely where, where the brain is hanging out a lot of the time. So my evolution has come to this place of like sloppy, but it has to be good enough. And I, and I, just to add one more point to it, I also think that computation itself is fundamentally, uh, regularizing or robustness making. If you want to be a successful organism and you have to integrate whatever information in order to eat, you'd better do it reliably. And the dynamics of your system, neural system that's making those decisions, it's going to reflect that. And though, thus, when you look in the state space and the dynamics, you're going to see something, hopefully, that's intelligent, intelligible. To me, there's also something, um, I, I guess one, one, okay, I think the idea of the, of a tension between these two ends of a spectrum that David described, you know, this very ordered and very chaotic, and that the things are in the middle. I think it also exists in neural data itself. So again, historically, because I, I, I think because people uh, recorded single neurons, then they had to make sense of these single neurons. So they gave them names and they told stories about them. <laughs> um, and, and that sort of pushes you towards the side of the spectrum where everything makes a lot of sense and every piece of the puzzle has a very specific role, um, in the all, in the, in the entire organism or network. Whereas this echo state approach says, you know, nothing matters and everything looks like a mess. And, um, to me, I, I started, uh, looking at data uh, during my PhD. I looked at, at, uh, neural data. And, and this, this to me was, was the push away from the ordered part because I was sort of, I read the papers and I saw the nice neurons in the figures of the paper. And then I looked at the data. And suddenly, I mean, how come the figures represent 10% of the data and 90% looks like junk and then i start speaking to more and more people and say oh yeah of course you know 90 percent looks like junk we just pushed in a drawer and never looked back and then i said okay so so the data tells me that we need to go somewhere that's less organized and then personally 
uh, my my natural inclination is towards the let's say the eco state approach of uh, you know let's you know let's take this mess messy pile and and everything can work and we don't need any uh, predetermined structure we don't need to to memorize names of you know if, if if every neuron has a name or every brain area has a name or every gene has a name I need to know these names and I'm very bad at memorizing names so i'm I'm more comfortable personally with this holistic approach but then I know I'm wrong I mean I, I know that I, I you know I'm criticizing these single neurons too harsh in a sense so I, I know that it's my personal laziness that pushes me too far into that end of the <laughs> spectrum and I know places exist and I know things that you know um, this organization is there so in a sense to me personally it's uh, I'm, I'm sort of using these many times, you know, as, as sort of uh, thought experiments in a sense that I'm, I'm saying, let's see if, if, if something that's as wild as this can work, but I know it's too far. And, and then I, I correct myself in a sense. So, so to me, let's say the interaction with, with data is both to push away from that pole and to attract myself back to that pole because of my personal sort of inclinations so when you guys use dynamical systems do you feel like you're learning about brains or minds or both definitely both both uh, is there a distinction do you distinguish between brain and mind uh david boy that's that that, qu that question's a that, that question's above my pay grade i think i mean <laughs> what i'm trying to do what we you know yeah. what i'm trying to do is make the pieces and components lead up to computation and whether or not computation is mind is anyone's guess, right? Certainly in its most basic mm -hmm. forms, it's not. But in, you know, if you, if you say, well, if all these pieces are functioning correctly, somehow mind arises, well, maybe, maybe I'm speaking towards that, but I, I really, I really wouldn't mm. know for sure. Omri, I mean, I'll ask you the same question and then we'll get into, um, you know, just using RNNs as model organisms. So I guess the yeah, brain mind is a tiny question, but, uh, I guess, um, <laughs> I think the way I view mind is a bit like, uh, I don't know, temperature or other emergent properties, if you will, in physics. Is it, uh, sure. A, a convenient, a convenient name for a complex phenomenon. Um, and, and that's, and the thing is that these, you know, convenience means that Ignoring that can be radically, you know, extremely inconvenient. Sort of only saying there's, um, you know, there's a bunch of neurons and they are active, and let's not talk at all about uh, whether there are internal representations and whether there are thoughts and, and things like that um, might make, like, you know, maybe technically correct, but extremely inconvenient and therefore not so useful. So, um, so that's sort of you know, just. I guess a rough thing. Whether whether these you know dynamical system concepts are applicable to brain and to mind, well, to brain certainly because that's the dynamical system we are mm -hmm. considering. To mind, in some sense, they have to do that. Um, but you might even say that uh, again, if if you want to be uh, extremely radical. You could say that the dynamical system is brain and the fixed point structure is mind. Because the, um, right. that's the emergent phenomenon, right? You, you have, um, a certain connectivity that, that developed through some interaction with the environment. And, and now you have this, you know, this, let's say fixed point landscape or dynamic landscape. And that, and there are many different implementations that could give to this rise to the same landscape. But that landscape is what allows you to function in the world, if you will. So, so in a sense, that's the, the sort of the higher level. Whether that higher level, you know, of course, it's it's a tiny component of mind. You know, there's no emotions, and the, mm -hmm. it's it's you know, it's a very it's a very small component. But I think it it does have the the f a flavor of an emergent phenomenon because you have. You have a certain dissociation. You can have many different networks that will give rise to the same dynamical landscape, 
and to function in the world, you care about the dynamical landscape. You don't care too much about the lower level implementation. So, so in that sense, I think you could sort of, uh, again, uh, probably uh, irritate in several philosophers, but, uh, but I think you could equate these, these two levels to brain and mind. That's why I, you know, I, it's, it's hard for me. I'm still wrapping my head around thinking about fixed points and, uh, you know, dynamical landscapes because it almost, and especially the vocabulary doesn't help because the word attractor sounds causal, right? And then you start to think about, you know, a fixed point is like pulling the uh, neural activity toward it when, what, as you just said, it's more of an emergent property that this, these things are happening and they, it just, the system uh, happens to be configured such that uh, there are these fixed points in the landscape. But then, you know, and, and, you know, like we think of mind sort of as like causal, and this is, now we're going way off rail here, you know, whether mind can cause things, you know, and uh, whether mind is epiphenomenal to brain, but it just, I don't know, there, it has this in-between kind of feel that feels like it's getting at least closer to being right between brain and mind, but, you know, it's, there's still a lot of stuff up in the air, I feel like. So that, that's why I was asking what it feels like to you guys. Well, to, to the degree, again, I feel like I'm over my, out over my skis here, but to the degree that dynamics is related to mind, then we're on the right track. Right? Right. And if, if you feel like the dynamics are emergent from, from the parameters and the middle part is the fixed point skeleton that determines the topological flow of everything, then, you know, we may be on the right track. But that, that's really all I have there. All right, guys. So backing up, um, so the history of neuroscience is mostly studying animal models, right? Model uh, animal model organisms. You study their behavior, their their brains. You study their behavior. Give it a task. See what comes out while you're recording brain activity, etc. And then you infer generally to humans. And I guess you know, in, with fMRI and uh, a bunch of other technologies, now we're recording human brain activity or proxies thereof. Um, but you both, uh, it's interesting, you both introduce your talks often with this idea of using recurrent neural networks as the new model organism, essentially. Um, and you both talk about the difference between the, this more classical neuroscience approach to modeling where you think about what might be going on and you build your model that way versus a more machine learning modeling approach uh, to understanding recurrent neural networks, be they artificial um, or, or natural. Um, D uh, David, can you just explain the difference? And then Omri, I'll, I'll come back to you for, for a question as well. Yeah, sure. So the uh, tried and true methodology for a good number of decades in the early computational neuroscience was uh, you, you observe a phenomenon in some neural data, and then you go build a machine that is a, a neural network by hand that reproduces some features of that data. And if you can do that, then it's a reasonable thing to say that whatever you cooked into that network could potentially, as a hypothetical, as, as rather as a hypothesis, uh, explain the neural data that was observed. Uh, that's called building a model, right? And the, <laughs> uh, you know, by hand, and it's great. Um, and so, uh, but given the difficulty in especially systems neuroscience, right? When, when lots of things are interacting, that's, that's when, that's when sort of reductionism starts to fall apart uh, methodologically. Mm -hmm. Um, given this sort of lack of progress, it became a question, well, what if, what if we just don't know how to do that? What if it's either too hard? We don't have the right ideas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, too high dimensional. Who knows, right? We just don't have the intuitions. And so that's where the training approach comes in. That is to say, uh, you know, the, the way that I would express it is under some, uh, under some robustness principle, we don't want all solutions. We'd like our solutions to not be insane, but under some robustness principle, just let an optimization of all of these parameters sort of settle down into something that looks like your data and then go study that, right? So that's, that's what the approach is. Just to follow along there, Omri, you, um, you think recurrent neural networks and dynamics may, you know, provide the the quote unquote correct or better simple parts that we need to study um, to to learn about the larger, more complex functioning system. Uh, can can you just elaborate on that idea? Yeah, I mean, so uh, one thing I just sort of want to remember to to mention is that 
I think similar things have been done in uh, um, evolution, basically. So gen- there was uh, uh, there still are some works that, that try to um, use genetic algorithms uh, to get, uh, let's say, genetic circuits, and that that would do a certain function. Um, I think most, again, not all. So many of these works use very low dimensional, so they. Wanted to see how a, how a negative feedback circuit arises, so you have like you know, five nodes or something. Um, there are works that that use larger networks, uh, either enzymatic or genetic. Uh, um, Kanekolab has quite a few of them. These approaches exist in, in other realms as well. And then now I completely lost my thread of. Uh, well, I mean, you've you've made the point that part of part of the entire point of science is to um, use simplified things and use the simple parts to understand the yeah, larger. So, so then there's the question of of why why do you need a model at all, right? I mean, so in principle, um, if you want to understand a system, then you you want what what does it mean to understand the system or to have a model of a system? And and there are many and different answers to that. Some people say that it's um, prediction that if you can predict how the system will, will respond to a novel stimulus, others will say that if you build it, right? If I know how to build something that does this function, then I understand um, how it works. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole you know bird playing uh, conundrum of I can build something that does the task, but is it do I understand birds? And I think um, a I think it's ill-defined. I don't, I don't think there's there's an answer to, to what does it mean to understand something. Personally, I, I think that I'm sort of, I, I guess, in between the prediction and, and the building part. And it's a rather subjective question, actually, what does it mean to understand something? I think you'll, you'll have different people give you very different answers for the, for the exact same system. Uh, whether, you know, for some people, if you don't have a pharmaceutical agent, that cures a certain disease, they will say that they did not understand the system. And others will say that having you know, a pharmaceutical agent it means nothing about understanding because it just means that you found a trick that works by accident. But if you look at it and you know what it means, then that's understanding. And a, it, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I think I'm speaking for Omri here as well, but speaking for myself for sure, I mean, we're definitely in the camp of, did you even understand the data at all, right? So, <laughs> yeah. like, l- let's let's not lose sight, right? I mean, yeah. there are data sets in neuroscience where nobody has any idea what's going on. And so, I feel like the progress, and I do think it is progress, however limited, that we were able to help along with is say, hey, look, there is a way to even come up with words for what that data might be doing. Mm. Because, uh, you know, at least for some examples, before this re- reverse engineering approach, there, the, 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 nobody knew. They literally just didn't have an idea. So I do feel like there's been some progress in that, but I don't want to take it too far either. I think, I, I think there's a lot of misses that, that might be happening with this, the artificial neural network approach. Mm. Um, Something that's commonly talked about is, well, you know, what do you have, to, what do you have to put into it in order to make it look like your data? So it turns out that you'd like it to be as simple as match some task on, you know, the animal does task A, train a network to do task A. And wouldn't that be great if that was enough to make your neural system? Now, that is to say, not its outputs because you optimize them. So they, they're going to look like what the net, what the animal is doing, but the internals. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be nice if the internals, just based on that task matching, looked like the animal uh, model, animal neurons? Excuse me. It turns out it doesn't work, right? So that's the dirty secret of the approach: is that you have to add a lot of extra yeah. stuff. Yeah. And so what we're, what I think the, the the subfield is coming to is an understanding of, or trying to develop an understanding of what those things are. For sure, it's a robustness principle. That is, you don't want very crazy systems. That's just not what brains are doing, right? But there's other ones that are very particular to the, to the, uh, system at hand that you're studying. And so one could argue that what you're really doing now is instead of building a system, 
you're you're picking the hyper hyper parameters such that an optimization program builds your system. So if and if if you haven't reduced some complexity there, then you really just have kicked the can down down the sidewalk for a block without learning anything. But I but I don't I don't believe that. I think we I think you have reduced the complexity and and you have carved up the the space of solutions a little bit more. Yeah, I asked Omri that because um, he has expressed the notion that you know thus far neuroscience has by and large failed to find useful simple parts that you could then you know put back together that in an explanatory or building fashion to to make the the complex system so i mean does that ring true to you Omri? Uh, I, I mean i think that, again what i uh, basically yes so i think that you know my critique was of of the um let's say single neuron and in particular the single neuron that was exposed to a limited stimulus set um and then and then you stop picking on single neurons man they're just fine (laughs) uh no but but in a sense any any um all context dependence basically right so so if you if you probe a system with a very limited set of of stimuli um then often you'll find that uh, it does not generalize well when you want to understand how it works um otherwise and then the the question is whether these um but if if you chart this dynamical landscape then you might have you know th- then these rules could be more general um so in that sense these could be building blocks that are that are more useful um but again it, it maybe not i mean maybe you you do this um you train on a simple task and then you see that if the network has another task in the background then it will change completely perhaps or uh, and, and i think one one thing that i want to relate to to what um david said is that another way to think of it that you know you train you optimize a network to the task and then you hope that it will match the data just by virtue of that another way to think of it is that maybe you don't because um there could be several solutions to the task right so you could have if you think of it you have you take one particular um organism that trained on this task and then uh, you take one particular network that was trained on that task now it could be that two different um monkeys that learned the task or two different mice that learned the task solve it differently yeah if that happens then then what do you hope for i mean do you hope for the network to to match animal a do you hope it to match animal b do you hope it to match the common aspects of all animals that if if there are any um so so i think even that even that hope is sort of um if you stop to think of it it's not that trivial yeah, this also brings brings up the topic of universality here. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask, cause, um, let me ask one question then, then I want to pause and I'm going to ask you guys how, how we should proceed. But, um, you mentioned that, you know, the diff- different tasks and the simplicity of many of the tasks. And, uh, these days in neuroscience, there's just crisis after crisis around every corner. It seems about how we're doing it wrong. One of those is that we're not using ecologically valid tasks. And one of the strengths of uh, using, um, let's say, recurrent neural networks as model organisms is that you can give it these these same tasks that we're using in animal models, right? And then ask it um, to output some behavior, match the behavior, test the um, innards of the recurrent model, the dynamical um, uh, landscape, for instance, and compare that to what you see in monkeys, much as, uh, you know, David's done, you, you both done. Do you worry at all that the tasks that you're asking your recurrent networks to perform, which are often even simpler, right? Three-bit tasks and sinusoidal wave tasks in an effort to simplify, in an effort to understand. Do you worry that asking your networks to perform a task that is so far removed from the way what animals do in the wild, for instance, that the answers that you're getting aren't applicable? So I I think there's really two axes there, right? One is uh, ethological relevance and the other is complexity of the task um yeah. and i'm yeah. much more concerned about the latter Be, as being as moving forward and getting the right answers yeah so yeah exactly so the last 10 years have been like hey let's apply these approaches and study these simple 
what are what we now call simple, although it wasn't obvious ten years ago. Mm-hmm. But uh, right. but study these simple tasks, right? And so that's gone, you know, from from memory to decision making to blah to blah to blah to blah, um, and, and we've just gone down the line. And so, well, the criticism, I think, extremely valid criticism, is like, well, brains do lots of things. And they, you know, so that's, is, is really the magic and, and how the different, how different tasks are solved. That is to say, if, if task A has something to do with task B, does, you know, is there a generalization aspect to that? And, and how is that captured in, in the dynamics, et cetera, et cetera? This is something that's deeply concerning to me. And, uh, you know, I work on that in my research with, with postdocs and pushing, pushing that idea forward of basically multitask systems. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's really critical, a critical element, which is like do lots of things. Right? And the other generality. is generality. That's right. And so the other is like uh, reaching, for example, let's say you wanted to understand arm reaches and, and motor control of arm reaches. It's one thing to say, hey, we do these standard center outreaches, reach up, reach down, left, right. Da, da, da. And so versus let's grapple with the, the, the total complexity of this. I don't know what it is, 50 degrees of freedom arm and, and digits that can lift and control force and strain and, it, you know, all, all the rest of it. And so I think that's where we want to go. But there are lots of problems in the way, including not the least of which is just experimentally getting that data in a, in a rigorous way. Right. So I think there's problems both on the experimental side and on the modeling side, but that's clearly where we need to be going. I think one one other aspect that um, uh, you know of, of, of where I think we we might want to go, um, and that's sort of a, a, a tricky aspect is is the process of learning itself. So in, in principle, the, I you know very much agree with David using the word optimization for this, and optimization in principle. In a sense, is a process that it doesn't have to be a process. Okay, optimization is is finding the best solution. Whereas if you think of of learning in in a biological that setting, it happens over time. And in many cases, I think you know both David and I and many others have been careful to sort of say, um, look, here is the network after it has been trained, and this is the object you should be concerned with. How we got there, you know, don't ask us about it. That's, you know, we, we pulled it out of somewhere. It, it's of no concern to you. And, yeah. and I think in many cases it's, it's, it's correct and it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a valid warning to, to issue. But I think another sort of aspect that I, I think is, is worthwhile to push forward. Um, and, and it's related to, to the, to the, uh, um, relation and validity with respect to biology. Is the process itself. So, for instance, if you, if you know how to perform many tasks, then they are built on one on top of the other, right? So you, you have an existing schema of, of that, that you learn, for, that you generalize for many tasks, and now you learn a new one. Compositionally, you mean? It, it can be compositional, it can be, you know, um, you know, these issues of catastrophic forgetting or, uh, but if you, if you, if you, learns a family of tasks and you learn them sequentially or you learn you know, a battery of tasks and then you add another one that already has something with the process in which in which you learn in which you learn and and i think that's also somewhere where we can connect um better to to constraints mm. uh, that that are in the in the experiments themselves I, I guess I agree. It's just, it's too hard for me. Right? <laughs> like, you know, when you look at the literature on, on learning and in, in, in the, in the biology, it's, it's, it's the classic example of like a thousand, a hundred thousand small details with no way of figuring out how those small details come together into something that makes any sense. So I, I find the problem overwhelming personally. So you guys are both working on what you might call a space of solutions, right, for recurrent neural networks. And that is like for a given task or a sequence of tasks, right, or, or you know, interleaved or, you know, however you, you want to do it, um, a family of tasks, uh, depending on how you initialize weights and how you train, um, you know, that process, uh, what range and types of solutions, you know, arise um, through training that network. And, and David, some of the latest work that you've been doing is, is on what you call universality, 
which is, you know, and you can correct me, but the roughly the idea that different neural networks might converge to, you know, the same or universal uh, solutions, right? And Omri, you're maybe more skeptical and, and through your work, you've seen that maybe this is not so much the case. So I, we can just go down that road a little bit. And David, did I define universality correctly and, and take it from there? Yeah, sure. So <laughs> I'm going to defuse it a little bit at the outset. I, I'm going to be talking about an ideal here and, and surely uh, what happens in real life, if anything about what I'm hypothesizing is true, would not be ideal. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still a guiding idea. Um, so the idea of universality is that different dynamical systems sort of uh, have properties that are conserved despite the fact that the equations are different or in, in our parlance, despite the fact that the parameters of our neural networks are different, right? So the classic example, it, it, this, there's lots of classic physics examples, but they're pretty complicated. But the, the classic example in math is Feigenbaum's delta. So with these little one-dimensional RNNs, one-dimensional maps they're called, you can show that if the if the one dimensional map has certain properties, it's unimodal, and and it's, it's three or four of these properties. But basically, it, it, if it has these things, it doesn't matter what the equation form is. It will have a number called Feigenbaum's delta related to the onset of chaos, and that number four six four point six six nine something 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 something. It's the same number across any system that has these properties, right? So I took a lot of inspiration from this example. First off, it's just great uh, science and accessible and people should look it up because it's amazing. Um, but, you know, in terms of my own work, via reading some of that and conversations with people along the way, I've started to wonder if artificial neural networks are similar to the degree that we're showing them. Right? You have, we're already buying into that hypothesis and not everybody does. Um, but to the degree that artificial networks are similar to brains, is there not a universality property going on? That is just, so to apply the universality idea directly to brains and, and artificial networks, that is, despite the fact that the equations of RNNs are almost surely totally different than whatever biophysical equations you'd write down for a brain, no matter what level of abstraction you try to get at, uh, you're still going to have massive uh, mismatches, right? Mm -hmm. So given all of that mismatch between what we're trying to model and the tool, the RNN that we're using to model it, why should anything look similar, right? And my evolution on this topic, I've, I've basically come around, I'll admit it, I'm very much in the universality camp. And I'll, let me tell you a little bit about my evolution on the topic. I, I mean, in my PhD 15 years ago, when I started making networks and, and you know, copying the echo state network algorithms out of the out of the paper and, and studying what was going on i thought a neuron was a neuron and what i mean by that is an artificial neuron in my network was a one-to-one -one mapping to a real neuron in a brain i actually buy bought that idea and i don't believe it anymore not one bit you mean fun functionally you mean yeah, functionally. I'm sorry. Obviously, there's a neuron is a physical thing in a, in a, in a biological <laughs> animal. Versus, the, the, mapping, uh, the, the mapping doesn't sort of... That's right. Yeah. Not, I, I thought the mapping was one-to-one -one at the neuron level. So... You were naive. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, so, uh, but when you take a closer look, you say, well, there is, you know, neurons have integration properties that integrate their, their inputs over synapses and then they decide to fire. So there is a little bit similar similarity there, but by and large, I mean, artificial networks have floating point accuracy. They're, they're, they're rate networks. There's no spikes going on, right? There's a lot of reasons to be deeply skeptical. And then at the higher level, the artificial network just has some equation, right? You, you say it's at, at, at its simpl most simplistic form, it's a linear system with maybe a, a saturating nonlinearity. So you have this matrix application to a vector and then you saturate it and that's your network. That's just not a brain, <laughs> nor is it even a, a network in a brain, right? There's so much other structure going on. Inhibition, excitation, spikes, all kinds of things in, in, in a real brain. So that asks the question, well, why should there be similarity? And so if you, if you move forward through, through the 10 years of applying RNNs to brains and, and seeing a, a number of successes, you say, well, what's going on there? So my thinking is that coming back to universality, the idea is that these dynamical skeletons, that is to say the fixed point structures, right? Those things are potentially uh, 
the conserved element, that those are the universality sort of numbers, if you will, the 4699, uh, 4669, uh, that that is the, the, what it, the, the universal property amongst these systems. And there's lots of reasons to think that that might be true, not, not necessarily the particular exact fixed point location, although if under very precise circumstances, maybe. But because these, the, when, when we look at fixed points, I don't actually care about a fixed point. I care about the topological flow of the dynamics in the high dimensional state space. And that's what these fixed point structures are negotiating. So if a, if a, if a task requires these properties to, to, to be done, if it needs these dynamics to be done correctly, then you need to organize a system to, that has those dynamical flows. And that's the idea of, of universality to me as applied to artificial networks and biological networks. Is it valid to say that the other way to think about this is that given the vast differences that you described between, you know, a unit and a neuron, um, and yet these, uh, you know, the, the dynamical landscape when you, you know, train it on a task uh, comes out at least in a similar way, if not, you know, exactly the same in some cases. The other way to interpret that is that the dynamics is, is trivial and um, just something that would come out of so many other things that maybe it's like the least important thing. Maybe that reduces its importance, right? So that's a minor rebuttal, but just it occurred to me that that's one way to think about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think that falls into the, the line of criticism that what we're really studying is tasks and not, and not animals. So I, I think to some extent that's true, right? And, 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 but nor do, so again, I want to diffuse this a little bit. I don't think that that everything is universal. I think it's a guiding property. And if you, if you set up precise artificial examples, you could find, I'm guessing my hypothesis, very conserved, probably universal structures of fixed point skeletons, right? But coming back to the animal, which is what you're talking about, I mean, the animal has to do lots and lots of things. So lots and lots of tasks to survive. So my guess is that the analogy there is, well, when we see something, when we see a dynamic in an artificial network that helps us understand the recordings, that is the dynamics, the state space dynamics of, of animals, and we see an overlap there, that what we're, why we're seeing an overlap there is some hint or substructure of u universality required to do the task, or for example. It, well, and David, I don't, you didn't really, and we don't need to go into detail, I suppose, but You've tested lots of different types. You, you ran a bunch of tests on hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of different families of recurrent neural networks and um, trained in different ways and looked at, you know, compared them all and then rearranged them and, and found that there is there are clusters, um, depending on how you look at it, uh, and that, you know, well, let's just let's just talk about it and then we can go back in, into Omri's uh, stuff and how it differs. Sure. So, so uh, there's geometrically, let's say, I'm going to summarize it and then you can uh, maybe detail a little bit more. So the geometry uh, differed among the recurrent neural networks, but the, and you can talk about what that means, but the fixed point topology, so um, basically the dynamical structure of the networks um, all sort of overlapped in many ways. So that was, that was this universal aspect is the overlapping dynamical structure, whereas the different architectures uh, differed in the geometry uh, of the representations. And maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, sure. So in, in that, we're talking about a purely artificial study. So there's no biological right. data here, right? So I'm, I'm testing the idea. We were testing the idea that even in an artificial setting, could we find things that were highly conserved, structures that were highly conserved across networks that had different equational forms, and different parameter initializations. That is to say, after training them to death, each of these networks, you get uh, something that the, the system solves. Each system solves a task. Do the internals, as we understand them, as visualized through a dynamical skeleton and what all of that means, are is that conserved? And this is and across what, LSTMs, vanilla RNNs, GNU. That's right, GRUs. Yeah, the, GRUs. Yeah, yeah whatever, whatever the, all the standard stuff that people are using in the field yep. right now. And, and, and keep in mind, those equations are very different. Like a vanilla RNN is a very different equation on paper than an LSTM. Very, very, very different. Um, so a mathematician would, would night and day, right? Um, they do have common elements, for example, saturations and matrix, multi ma matrix multiplies, but they're still very different. So what we found was that if you were to sort of... So, 
I don't know how, how precise to get here. Basically, the, the geometry of the solutions looked a little different. That is to say, some were stretched, some were rotated differently. There's also a, a non-identifiability there. But basically, the geometry varied from, from um, network to network. But if you were to imagine the flows of the dynamics, that is to say, the dynamical skeleton is negotiating these flows that creates a topology. So in other words, to me, this, if you have a, a, a long ellipsoid network uh, state space that does exactly the same set of flows topologically as a very compact circular one, that they're doing the same thing, right? And so what we found is in that topological view that literally every, every, ne every network was basically identical to keep in mind, you know, there's a lot of experimental, uh, artificial experimental, uh, te technology going on here, but across thousands of examples. And even if we got a few wrong in terms of our analysis, it would still be like, well, 99.9% .9 of these networks are all doing the same thing when viewed through this very specific dynamical systems lens. And that was, that was the result. First of all, I think the, um... I very much agree with with David's uh, view of of uh, and description here of of the first of all the analogy what or in a sense what is the proper way to compare the model data to the experimental data uh, right is it the single neuron level is it the task level is it the um, dynamical object level the PCA level? there are many different levels at which you can do this comparison and and I'm quite convinced again as david said that the single neuron is not is not sort of the correct one uh, again because it's biology is, is sort of uh, a single segment of a dendrite is more complex than a, uh, than a full artificial rna okay the, <laughs> but then i think that the you know your question and and what david said is is sort of highlighting uh, as always there's the spectrum right so if it doesn't matter then can I have, you know, a send pile, you know, equations of a send pile that, that don't even pretend to look like a neural network and they also implement, um, the same equations. And, and maybe I could, but, but then the question is, what are we modeling here? And I think, so now how, how would one approach that, right? So you could say, well, if it is as, so universal that no matter at all what, which equations I put at the, let's say, the implementation level, I always get the exact set of fixed point topology, then have I learned anything about the specific implementation the brain is using, or have I learned something about that task? If it is, again, in the, at the extreme case, if it doesn't matter at all, then obviously I have not learned anything about the implementation because I just proved the implementation is irrelevant. But but that's an extreme case. So uh, I think there are at least two interesting places to go there. One is geometry might matter. So it could be that the topological landscape is identical and is dictated by the task and not by the implementation. But you could get, let's say, geometrical insights or constraints from the neural data. And again, that, that has to be done carefully. And actually, I have not, uh, I have not carefully thought about how to do that while not, uh, while at the same time not requiring a neuron to be a neuron. But I think that it could be done in principle. Well, here are two. Yeah. Let me just give you two examples, right? From from yeah. neuroscience. Uh, from f so when when if you if you have a dynamical system and you say what you're really interested in is the topology of the dynamical flows, then you're making an argument that at least within orders of magnitude, you don't care about the dynamics, speed, right? Right. Uh, so uh, and so how how so sometimes it's just about getting from state space region A to state space region B and how that happens, whether it's a big swirl yeah. or whether it's this straight thing, it doesn't matter. So in that case, that's a case of dynamics not mattering where the topology does. But let me show you, like I believe examples where the dynamics matter. Well, for example, in the motor system, right? When I'm lifting my arm and controlling my arm, et cetera, et cetera, the speed at which that happens, it matters and it's precise. Um, another example is out of the, uh, Merdad uh, Jazir's lab, uh, 
uh, where they're talking about the geometry of a particular curve in state space as implementing a prior on, on some kind of decision making. Right. So that's a case where the geometry did matter. And so mm -hmm. I'm just helping yeah. the hedge here. So, so, so I think that's sort of one, one axis with which you can diffuse, uh, this criticism of over universality. Um, and then the other one is that it is possible to have tasks that are not universal. So, um, it, it is possible to have multiple solutions to the same task. And if that is the case, then once again, you can constrain your models with the particular solution um, attained by a particular um, animal. And in that case, you can also have different solutions for, right? You can have different strategies that, that different animals develop and, and you might sort of um, match them to different uh, strategies that are developed by your networks. And in a sense, you can take that even further and you can ask if I have a hundred rats or mice that solve this task, can I do statistics and ask what is the distribution of solutions? And now if I have a million networks, can I ask which aspects of network architecture, modularity, learn gruel, order of trials, or whatever, affect the distribution of solutions there? And does that inform me about some of these underlying uh, implementation constraints in the brain? So I think this uh, universality is sort of a question that has to be asked, but, but again, it lies on a spectrum. And I think that sort of Walking along the spectrum and breaking universality gradually and using that as a constraint to link to the data can be sort of a, 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 you know, a, a promising way forward. I totally agree with what Omri is saying. And I think there are different levels where things, where, so you basically, if you have a couple of solutions, then you may have a universality class, right? If, if it's at the algorithmic level, so for example, you can sort, you quick sort, heap sort, bubble sort, there's a gajillion sorts, right? At the algorithmic level, you would say, well, which one is someone doing? And then my guess is if you dive into the implementation detail and, and you might, for everyone who's doing a quick sort, the implementation might still be somewhat universal or at least have hints yeah. of it, right? So that's, that's one level. And the other level is, is really what Omri is saying about like, well, actually, even at the implementation level, of some of these tasks, there still could be various ways that, that, that in which it's done. And I'm aware of some some work actually uh, in in mice for integration tasks that that show mm -hmm. that. And so hopefully that'll come out soon. So uh, those were the comments mm -hmm. I wanted to make. Yeah. Then I, I guess sort of one one example that we sort of we are now sort of uh, uh, working on is is again the Jazairi uh, Ready Set Go attack that David mentioned earlier that we trained sort of a, a many networks on this task and and we saw different dynamical let's say topologies oh sorry Th this is the ready set go task is that what you said yeah yeah. yes okay. this is the ready set mm -hmm. go task so that basically the task is uh, um the, the animal receives uh, um, two two stimuli that are separated by a certain delay of time and it has to reproduce yeah ready set and then go and if you do ready set Go will come later at the same delay. So you have to sort of match the, match the ready set delay to, yeah. So we translate ready set into set go. And it turns out if you think of it as a dynamical landscape question, it's not that obvious. So it's not that you have sort of, you know, a decision and you go right or left to this fixed point or that fixed point, but all the action is happening in, in how fast you move or how, or, or where you go. And it turns out that networks that solve this task, um, some of them do this with, uh, um, let's say a, a one dimensional slow manifold and others do this with a two dimensional slow manifold. Some of them curve on top of themselves. Some of them do not. Some of them generate a limit cycle. And some of them do not. Now, the limit cycle is sort of 
um, too slow to matter when you train the network. But if you then sort of let it continue, then you, you see that some of them do that and some of them don't. Um, so, so in that case, you sort of have different variants of, of solutions um, to the same task. And, and again, that, and I think it raises many questions that we have very few answers so far. But, uh, for instance, if, if you, we use extrapolation. So you train the network on a, a certain set of delays, but then you challenge it with longer delays. Now, intuitively, if, 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 let's say, if I tell you what the task is, of course you'll be able to extrapolate because you know the rule. If I just, give you some examples of these delays, it's not clear how well you will extrapolate. There are some experiments that show that you will you will extrapolate, but you will do this, um, let's say, sublinearly. So you, you'll sort of, uh, you, uh, you will, uh, as the delays I present get longer and longer, you will start making shorter and shorter errors, sort of, uh, responses. You'll still respond longer than your training set, but not as long as you should have. Uh, there are some experiments from the 80s where people were sort of uh, using psychophysics to test extrapolation, and people don't do that. Well, it's ill-defined, but they don't do it as the experiment they would have expected. And uh, and you could ask, you know, is that even a fair thing to ask the network to do because it's sort of ill-defined? So if I say networks are different. When they extrapolate, um, is that a true difference or is it not? Should they only care about how they, they operate within their training regime? But, or maybe I can use that to probe the network or to compare it to the neural data. And I think these are, you know, we, we have some clues, but, but so far we have many questions as well. Let me let me just jump in and ask you what your thoughts are on uh, Uri Hassan's work about direct fit. And that, so, so what you're saying is, well, humans can extrapolate so we could uh, compare, or, or animals could, so we could compare natural neural networks to the artificial neural networks. But Uri's uh, suggestion, opinion, uh, is that, and, and his research shows uh, that maybe, you know, he, well, he believes that humans can't e- extrapolate and that we are just, we just have so many neurons. Our recurrent neural network is so large, has such high capacity that everything that we can do well is interpolation, is within the training set. And anything outside it, we actually fail at because we just haven't memorized, you know, how to do it or haven't had, uh, you know, examples of it. So and if that's true, then comparing between natural and artificial neural networks in that case wouldn't tell us anything. I don't know if you have thoughts about that. I guess it's very hard it's very hard to compare extrapolation in, in humans who have a lifelong experience and say whether it's extrapolation. Because the prior knowledge in RNN is, is right, it's a tabula rasa, right? You, you have, you create it out of nowhere and then you give it this task and this task is its entire life experience. And then you compare it to a subject walking into the room with a college degree and, you know, with, with a lifelong experience of, of being out and about. And, you know, is that a fair comparison? I think David spoke about it, the fact that, that real biological agents have a plethora of tasks that they were trained on and they, they, they share components and they use these shared components to, to better behave in a new scenario. And when you test a human on a, on a new stimulus, it's never really new because there's always some context. Whereas these artificial networks, you can really surprise them in ways that, that I don't think you can mm. do as well, um, with, with experimental subjects. I think it's, you know, the, it's not hopeless, but it's, it's, it's tricky, um, to compare that. Yeah. So I do, th- I do think being able to instruct humans is also a big deal, right? Uh, and, I think that if you really wanted to study some of this extrapolation, you could build, and in fact, I did with uh, Robert Yang, or well, Robert Yang did the building, but um, you could build networks that actually understand language. And, uh, you know, if you think about, confi- this is a side topic, but if you think about configuring a neural network to do task A, B, or C, normally you would say, well, 
I, here's a hot one for task A, hot one for task B, hot one for task C, uh, one hot encoding rather. Uh, but somehow language is modular generalizing uh, basically configuration for these systems, right? So I think there's, I think there's a world where we could uh, study those things. But jumping back out to the topic of uh, universality, I, I definitely agree with Omri that um, the specific details matter. And I, I don't mean to say that like my little crystal RNN, artificial RNN on my network is universally the same as some very complicated biological mammal organism, uh, you know, so, but to me, the idea is at least, I guess, maybe normative or helps me explain why when these things are so different, you might actually see some similarities at all. Right. And so that's really, that's really where I would hang my, my hat in terms of uh, leaning on, on that theory. Omri, you're hanging your hat in a different saloon or the same saloon <laughs> as, as David? Uh, I think uh, the only thing I'll add is that, um, again, this, you know, this spectrum. So I think that, that I want to go to the universality side and then take one step back and ask whether I can use this small lack of universality to, to sort of, you know, match the data or to, or to ask, you know, I know my model is ridiculously unbiological. But, for instance, is one feature of that more ridiculous than the other? If, if, I, if I hold the task and play with the you know, biological detail, will that bring me closer or further away from the data? So I, th I think it's, uh, I think, you know, universality is a good yeah. place to be, but, but again, we're doing linearization, right? But you want to be, to, to sort of perturb it a bit and see how it responds to various things. That's right. No, number one and number two. Do spikes matter? Yeah. Number number two, excitation and inhibition. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. There could be all kinds of reason. There's excitation and inhibition that is different cells, right? Cell types for biological networks that that are concerned with actual metabolism and and not getting epilepsy or whatever. Pick mm -hmm. pick your favorite reason why there should be things like this. Now, if those if those details matter to solutions then we should absolutely be putting them in our models. But if they don't matter, then we need to make a sort of concerted effort, both in terms of our work and something of a PR effort to say, hey, these things don't matter and we're not going to put these in because it's only obfuscating the point of the modeling. In, yeah. in the, right? I'm just zooming out though. Isn't it just wondrous and exciting and amazing that there is a resemblance that, that we can make you know, some headway into comparing these, you know, both of these complex systems and, and finding some sort of structure in the randomness, some sort of potential universality. I mean, doesn't that, do you ever just take the time to think, oh, how, how awesome is that? Or are you just too, are you too mired in the work to take the time? Oh, I think it's great. I think it's very cool, yeah. you know? And so like it, again, you know, this is why I don't get too caught up in the, like, does the brain implement backprop yeah. conversations? First off, the, 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 as I admitted before, the learning stuff just seems impossibly difficult to me. So I'm picking easier problems and much respect to those who are biting off the hard ones. Um, but on top of it, like if, if you really believe in some form of universality, however minimal, not however minimal, to some degree of universality, but not too much, then as long as these systems can sort of wiggle into semi-optimal solutions then it's not overly important how they got there. I, I probably just made 17 different enemies when I, but, but I kind of, I kind of believe that, right? Yeah. Again, I think it's, I think it's great. And, and again, as, as I sort of hinted earlier, I, I enjoy looking at, in a sense, even further away. Um, so, you know, looking at genetic networks, looking at, at, um, at, at topology mm -hmm. of, of genetic networks and, and there's, there's sort of surprising areas where you find, um, similar aspects. And, and I, and I, and I really enjoy that. So, uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm in a job that, that all I have to do is have fun, right? So I try to do that. Oh, oh that's a good way to end it. Let me, let me ask you guys just as kind of a, um, a question for, uh, the audience, for the younger people out there earlier in their careers. And then, and then we'll wrap up. Do you guys make time to go outside of your own expertise and think about the bigger questions? And uh, if so, you know, how do you fit that in? Do you 
take a day, like um, Romain, um, Rom- Romain Brett takes days off, uh, or at least he used to, like dedicated to thinking about the big picture, why it all matters, how it all fits together. Do you guys take that time? And if so, how do you do it? Yeah, so it depends on what you mean by big picture. I mean, that can get pretty cosmic pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> I don't mean tripping in the desert. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so so uh, no, I guess not really. No, I don't take that time. I'm, I'm, maybe, maybe it's because I already did it. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm. I, I have, uh, I believe that the work that I'm doing is important. And I, I, I have empirical evidence that it's making contact with data. Uh, so, you know, and I feel like I'm bridging, what I'm attempting to do is bridge gaps between the granular and the meso, at least, if not the macro. So I, I'm pretty okay with where I'm at. And I don't spend a lot of time on that question anymore, although I probably did early on in my career. Do you think it's important to spend that time early on in the, in your career? Absolutely. And you know, more narrowly, asking the, the right question is the hardest part of science, Yeah, right? Yeah. You have to get the questions right. It's easy to say, I care about consciousness, but how are you going to how are you going to get a crowbar into that question so getting that correct is the most important part and in fact you know when i sit down in in lab meetings and we we have full discussions with lots of people really the the most important part of that feedback for me is or, or you know, that that process is calibrating my questions so i i'm i'm lucky i guess to be in uh, the atmosphere i'm at is uh, there are people working on on around me on on various things and the sort of People talk a lot about you know, rather big questions. What ones of anecdotes that uh, when I gave my job talk, one of the uh, PIs there went and said, "Yo, that was a great talk, uh, but why are you working on the brain? I mean, who cares about the brain? You should, you know, there's lots of other stuff right. in biology that are more important." <laughs> and I sort of said, "You know, I, I I care about the brain, but I want to be in a place where people ask me that question." So. Um, so I, I think it's important to to be probed, to be poked, let's say, a bit out of your comfort zone um, every now and then. But as as everything in this conversation, right, there's a spectrum, and and you don't want to spend all your time being poked because you do nothing. Um, so, so yeah. at the end of the day, you have to do things. Right, yeah, and and I, and I think that's yeah. right. There's a balance. So. Um, whether this balance is, you know, a day a week or a, a day a month or a week a year, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's very personal, but, but I think it's, it's, it's important to sort of see that you're not drifting to, to one of these ends. And, and I have drifted to, to both ends at times. Well, thank you guys for spending the time with me. I look forward to next time when Omri is studying <laughs> ant colonies and David's still studying the brain, perhaps. But uh, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you. Super fun. Thanks for having me. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.